Chapter 6 A Visit to the King's Tailor Porthos took his time saying goodbye to Marie. You are the love of my life. Never before have I seen such beauty in a woman. Never. Oh, Monsieur Porthos, I love you too. But you must leave now. I want to die in your arms, Marie. Athos was trying to pull him away. Porthos, if you don't hurry, we will all die. You will see Marie again as soon as Philippe is king. I rode off alone, not knowing for sure whether I would ever see my friends alive again. There was only one road from Blois to Paris, so Fouquet and I had to pass each other at some point. I just hoped that I would see him first and have time to go into a field or a farmhouse until he and his men had passed. A horse, however, is not easy to hide, nor is a captain of the King's Guard whose uniform is known throughout France. After I had gone about a mile, I had an idea. I noticed a carriage some way behind me, so I got off my horse and waited by the side of the road. When the carriage reached me, I made a signal for it to stop. What's the matter, Captain? said the driver, a man with a scar down one side of his face. He was most probably a soldier back from the war. My horse has injured its leg and I have to be in Paris by nightfall. I was wondering if you would let me ride with you. I don't know, sir. I shall have to ask my lady. I beg you to do so. I am on the king's business. Well, if it's the king's business... The driver spoke to someone in the carriage and I could hear a lady's voice from within. Then a pretty head appeared, which reminded me of Louise. Are you in trouble, sir? At that moment, I heard the sound of horses coming in our direction. Yes, madame, I am. Could I tie my horse to the back of your carriage and ride some of the way with you? She had a beautiful smile. Of course, sir. I would be happy to have the protection of an officer of the musketeers. I quickly tied the horse to the back of the carriage and got in. At that moment, Fouquet and his men came round the corner. The lady looked at me with some surprise when I took off my own hat and asked if I could borrow hers. I also asked for her cloak and, with her permission, wrapped it around me. You must be in trouble, my dear sir. A little, my lady, but it will pass, I hope. By now, Fouquet and his men had passed us. When they saw the horse tied to the back, Fouquet ordered the carriage to stop. Driver, whose horse is that? It belongs to the Duchess of Arem, said the fine lady, putting her head out of the carriage window. I found her lying by the side of the road. Her horse was frightened by a rat and threw her off. Fouquet, always suspicious, tried to look in. Please, my dear sir, do not bother her. She is not at all well. I lay in the corner of the carriage, covering myself as best as I could with the cloak. Luckily, it was edged with fur around the top, which hid my moustache. My lady, do you need any help? Said Fouquet, trying to see around the lady, who was doing her best to hide me. Perhaps one of my men. You are too kind, sir. Said the lady. But all she needs is rest. Isn't that so, my lady? I nodded my head. In that case, we will be on our way. Said Fouquet. By the way... Who do I have the pleasure of talking to? The Countess de la Valliere, monsieur. Good heavens! Not the mother of Louise de la Valliere. I think I may have let out a small cry of surprise. Yes, indeed. Do you know her? She is a great success at court, your ladyship. The king's favourite at the moment. So I have heard. You also spend time at court, monsieur. Yes, I am the king's chief minister. We're looking for some traitors hereabouts. You haven't seen three men carrying swords with another man that looks very much like the king, have you? If I had seen anyone looking like the king, I assure you I would have noticed. No, it's been very quiet this morning, apart from the Duchess's little accident. Ah, yes. 
the Duchess. Well, we had better be on our way. We have a long journey ahead of us, and we must visit my personal doctor so that he can take a look at the Duchess. I see. I see. Well, have a good journey, Countess. I wish you good day. At last, Fouquet moved away from the carriage and ordered his men to move forward. After a few hundred yards, when the sound of horses had faded, I felt it was safe to take off my disguise. I don't know how to thank you, Countess. I only hope I did the right thing. Although I must say, you don't look like a traitor. I'd like to think I am not, Countess. You'd like to think you are not. Well, I hope you are not going to put your sword through my heart. That would be most unfortunate. <laughs> I laughed. So, who are you, sir? I am captain of the king's guard at the palace. D'Artagnan, at your service, my lady. At the palace, Monsieur D'Artagnan. It is indeed a pleasure to meet you at last. How very exciting this day has been! My daughter has told me so much about you in her letters. Is that so? In fact, she talks about very little else, apart from the king. Who seems to have taken a fancy to her? More's the pity. The countess examined me more closely. Now that I see you more clearly, I understand. What is it that you understand? I said. Why my daughter writes about you all the time? I think she is very fond of you, Captain D'Artagnan. Oh dear, you have gone quite red in the face. Who would have thought that a captain of the musketeers could blush? I did not wish to continue this conversation. I must be on my way, Countess. I have a great deal to do before the king's birthday party. Will I have the pleasure of seeing you there? Yes, of course. I look forward to it. I looked out of the carriage window to make sure Fouquet and his men were no longer in sight. Thank you, Countess, and au revoir. Be careful, Captain. My daughter would be very unhappy if anything should happen to you. Please give her my love when you next see her. I untied my horse, mounted, and set off at a gallop for Paris. Throughout the journey, all I could think about was how Aramis, Athos, Porthos, and Philippe would get past Fouquet and his men, or had they already been caught and arrested? The king's tailor, Percerin. Walked with small steps and had a high-pitched voice. His long fingers moved up and down as he spoke, as if he was playing a musical instrument, and his eyelids were like butterflies fluttering over a flower. He took me by the hand and led me into a large room filled with half-finished coats and jackets. I'm so happy to see you, Captain D'Artagnan. To think that you have at last come to me to have me make a suit for you. No, Monsieur Berserin, it is not for me. It is for the king. For the king, but I have already made the king a new suit for his birthday party. That is why I am here. He needs another. Another. A second set, exactly the same. Why? This is absurd, my dear fellow. Even the king cannot wear two suits at the same time. No, but we are going to surprise him by making him a present of a portrait, showing him wearing the same suit he will have on at the party. I see. And you need another suit for the man posing for the painter. Oh dear! Oh dear! Oh dear! The king's tailor walked up and down, waving his arms like a peacock shaking its wings. You have no idea how busy I am, Captain. I have to finish the king's suit, and Monsieur Fouquet wants a suit, and now, how can I possibly? The portrait will make the king very happy. Of course, of course, but I am only human. On the word "human," Perceval squeaked, and you will be very well paid for your work. Well paid, well paid. This," said Perceval, pointing to the coat nearest him, "is a work of genius." Can such a garment be paid for with mere money? No, Monsieur Perceval, it cannot. But I can only make the offer. I poured thirty gold louis onto the table. Perceval's eyes became bigger, 
and the butterfly eyelids went quite mad as he took in the shining gold pieces that lit up the darkest shadows of the room. When did you say you wanted the second suit, Captain D'Artagnan? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? But the party is not for ten days. Tomorrow evening. <laughs> Perserin waved his hands madly in front of his face to cool himself down. Genius, Captain D'Artagnan, is a curse, not a blessing. All right. I will have it ready by tomorrow evening. Excellent, Monsieur Perserin. I will send someone to pick it up at seven o'clock. I bent down to pick up the money again. But as I did so, Perserin laid his hand on mine. I will take payment now, if you don't mind, Captain. It's not that I don't trust you, but you know how things are. Times are hard, Captain. Times are hard. Then, just as I was about to leave, Fouquet came in with two of his soldiers. My hand reached instinctively for my sword. D'Artagnan, what a surprise. Is this where you look for traitors? Or is Monsieur Perserin making you a suit, too? The captain wants me to... The man is a genius, I interrupted quickly. He can do anything. So, D'Artagnan, what progress have you to report? Very little, Monsieur Fouquet, though I am told Athos is at his home in Blois. Perserin had taken off Fouquet's jacket and was helping him to put on his new suit, a very rich garment, all in gold. I wondered whether Fouquet had forgotten that he was the king's minister and not the king himself. I could have told you that two days ago. I have just been there. I missed them by a matter of minutes. However, I am hard on their heels. Is that so? They will be somewhere in Paris, I am sure. I see. Perserin held up Fouquet's arm and pushed in a pin which made Fouquet shout. Ouch, Perserin, please take care. I am not a pincushion, you know. <gasps> Forgive me, Monsieur Fouquet, but I am under such stress. Very well, very well. But we will catch them, D'Artagnan. There aren't many places where they can hide. I have every spy in Paris looking and have offered 5,000 gold louis for each of them. I would not be surprised if by tonight their heads are grinning down on the people from the gates of the city. Three of them at least. The other will be on his way down the Seine. That is very good news, Monsieur Fouquet. Yes, indeed. I have certainly been more successful than you in this matter. I trust you are still the king's loyal servant, D'Artagnan? Fouquet turned impatiently to the tailor, who was putting in more pins. Persera, haven't you finished yet? Very soon, very soon, Monsieur Fouquet. I am only human, you know. Do you doubt me, Monsieur Fouquet? I said, wondering if he thought that I was involved in the plot. I trust no one. That is why I am still alive and still the king's chief minister. I hope to see results very soon, D'Artagnan, or else I may not be so trusting in the future. If anyone knows Paris well, it is you, and you also know where your friends are most likely to hide. So forget about the king's party and start hunting. Purser and purser and you're like a mother hen. Cluck, 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 will you ever be finished? That is the price you pay. For the best tailor in France, Monsieur Fouquet. Get on with it, then! I left Perserin fussing over Fouquet and hurried to my friend's new hiding place, hoping they had managed to get there without being seen. <laughs>